Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the webinar, Your Turn. Experts answer your facility's Sarah System 1 transition questions. Please note that this presentation is being recorded. If you have a question during the presentation, you may submit your question at any time by typing your email address and question into the boxes below the slide. If we don't have time to answer your question, we will follow up with you after the webinar has completed. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Barbara Trattler, Director of Clinical Education for Advanced Sterilization Products. Barbara, you may begin. Hello and welcome. I am Barbara Trattler, Director of Clinical Education for Advanced Sterilization Products, or ASP. Thank you for joining us today, the fourth webinar in our series, to help those who are affected by the Steris System 1 transition. The goal of today's webinar is to answer some of the most pressing questions that we have received from attendees of the last three webinars, as well as what customers are asking us in our regular conversation. Before we begin answering questions, I'd like to briefly talk about the common thread that brings us all together today. We are here because we are all deeply concerned with infection prevention in the surgical arena. Medical devices and equipment that are not sterilized properly put patients at risk of healthcare-associated infections, HAI. HAIs are one of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States, with an estimated 1.7 million people acquiring HAIs each year. HAIs also contribute to increased healthcare costs with an estimated annual economic impact of more than $17 billion in the United States. At ASP, we strive to create the safest possible environment for patients and their families, healthcare workers, providers, and communities. We'd like you to hear a surgeon's perspective on infection prevention. Dr. Dowling is an orthopedic surgeon and chairman of the Department of Orthopedics at Morristown Memorial Hospital in Morristown, New Jersey. And here is what he has to say. We also have to rely on people we don't see, which are the, the people that take care of our instruments upstairs, the central supply area, where they clean the instruments, uh, they make sure that they're sharp and accurate and that the trays uh, that provide this are fully, uh, uh, fully filled. Uh, they um, are responsible for the sterilization process, which is quite com complex and quite intensive, and the quality assurance that's related to that whole process itself, which is almost an entirely different world. And yet, we all depend on one another to make that process occur uh, the way it should. I couldn't agree more. Infection prevention involves many different and interdependent groups within a particular healthcare setting. Now, we'll begin to answer questions. You will be hearing from me, along with my colleague, John Sayhid, Product Director, Low Temperature Sterilization at ASP. We will also be joined by Nancy Chopin, who is an independent nurse consultant and educator with more than 30 years of experience as a registered nurse in sterile processing. She is the President and CEO of Sterile Processing University, LLC, an online sterile processing education and continuing education website. Nancy also is the corporate sterile processing educator for the St. Barnabas Healthcare System in West Orange, New Jersey. Let's start with our first question, which has to do with the FDA action concerning the SS1. What is the reason for the FDA notice regarding the need to transition from the SS1? Is it mandatory to stop use of the SS1 by July 2011? Are there any exceptions? Are there consequences to not switching? The FDA has given healthcare institutions 18 months or until August 2011 to transition from the SS1 to another legally marketed alternative. However, the FDA also gave medical device manufacturers only 12 months until February 2011 to remove the SS1 from their device's instructions for use. 
The FDA recommends that if you have an acceptable alternative to the SS1 to meet your sterilization and disinfection needs, you should transition to that alternative as soon as possible to ensure continued patient safety. If you do not have an acceptable alternative to the SS1, you should promptly assess your facility's patient care needs and sterilization and disinfection requirements and take steps to obtain legally marketed substitutes for the SS1. We also thought it would be helpful for you to hear a clip from a previous webinar when June Wyrus, RN, Director for Perioperative Services at Capital Health, spoke about how she addressed the transition. I first found out about the FDA announcement regarding the SS1 probably within a day of its release. There were a lot of questions that came to mind because this is a product we had been using for many years. So our first thought was it couldn't possibly be the equipment we've been using. But I soon found out otherwise, and I knew that we had no choice but to act on it. I knew it would only be a matter of time before the folks in infection prevention would start asking questions and looking to us for answers. So we had to get working on it. The first thing we did was bring together some lead people. Uh, at the table from the operating room and central sterile processing. We plotted out the kinds of instruments that were going in the SS1 and what the possible alternatives that we had at our immediate disposable. And how did those alternatives impact our turnaround times? We have another question related to the FDA notice regarding the need to transition from the SS1. The question is, when will Steris stop supporting the SS1? The consent decree dated April 20, 2010, between Steris and the FDA, prohibited Steris from distributing the SS1. As part of the consent decree, Steris created a Certificate of Medical Necessity, which requires the signature of the facility's president, chief executive officer, chief medical officer, chief operation officer, or chairperson of the review board, to continue using and receiving support for the SS1 during the transition period. Please listen carefully. If a facility is currently is using an SS1, the facility must have a signed certificate of medical necessity. The deadline for signing that certificate of medical necessity is July 2, 2010. What that means is that if you don't sign the certificate, you cannot purchase supplies, accessories, or replacement parts for the SS1. Hi, this is Nancy Chobin, and I'm going to answer the next few questions. Let's start with, why is there need for urgency in switching from the SS1? Don't I have until August 2011? There is a lot of confusion on this issue. The FDA clearly recommends that if you have an acceptable alternative to the SS1, you should transition to that to ensure patient safety. The FDA has really stepped up to the plate on this issue. The FDA website is an excellent resource for additional information on what facilities are expected to do. In addition to potential liability, if your facility receives a visit from surveyors from the Joint Commission, one of the first questions they are going to ask is what is your game plan to transition from the SS1? You need to have a plan ready to show them.